I'm going to be talking about experimental phasing methods in protein crystallography. Um, and it's mainly because it's, it's fun and interesting to do. And as Joe pointed out, the picture of my dog, I love having this because it actually shows what happens if you, you only have magnitudes for um, instead of phases. Because if you look at this picture, right, it looks like my dog is sitting there contently, looking off into the distance, pondering her life's choices. But this is, of course, not true. If you add some, some real space constraints to it, meaning she's my dog and um, she knows me and loves me, then you realize that she's actually facing me in this picture and looking my way. Um, which is why I always like this as an introduction to, to phasing talks. Uh, oops, why is my... I change this to laser pointer. Okay, so just a quick outline, because I think Joe said I was going to be talking about mad and sad. Um, but in addition to mad and sad, I'm also going to be talking about zero and near, and then the combination of everything, which is called zeros and miras. We'll get into what these things actually mean. And the reason I'm going to, to add these other two in is because they're actually a lot more robust and um, tend to give better phases. And it's what I like doing because it gives more robust phases. And it's how protein structures were actually phased way back when. So we're first going to have a look at them. Um, and then we're going to just touch a bit on crystallographic data analysis at the start, because I'm not sure what people's current standings are. And there's a few things we need to know um, before we move on to the actual phasing methods. Then we're just going to talk one, one note. I think I have one or two slides on the final structure. And that's just because people are usually kind of gloss over it. They're, OK, I phased my structure. I have the structure. All is good. We're done now. So there's a few things we, we do still need to do at the end, which is called structure validation. But I think George is probably also going to go into that because it's more important for molecular replacement, which is what he's going to be talking about next. And then if there's still time, I'm just going to touch on, on some differences with these phasing techniques between serially collected crystallographic data and what we call conventional data, as in how it's been done for probably about 100 years now, um, just, just out of interest's sake because that's what my research is on. And we all know that we can't do teaching talks without adding a bit of our own stuff in there. OK, so what is crystallographic data processing? It's, as you guys probably know from school, um, what you see in the background is a diffraction pattern from a, a protein crystal, um, which is these, these dark little spots. And the whole point of crystallographic data processing is that we somehow need to, to get structural information out of these spots. And that's what we do. So we, we're going to um, assign unique identifiers to these spots. And then we're going to use these spots to actually calculate what our protein structure must have looked like. Um, so here is just the, the general setup of um, the crystallography experiment. So you guys kind of have something that you can imagine when we go through this. Um, the conventional way is shown here on the right. We have a protein crystal that is just on, so it's called a goniometer. It's just a, a stand that can <clears throat> rotate the crystal through an X-ray beam. And then we collect the scattered X-rays on a detector. Um, and the, the reason that we, we rotate the crystal is so that we can rotate hopefully through reciprocal space and get a complete data set of the crystal in all orientations. A new method that has been coming about for the last 10 years is that instead of having a single crystal that we rotate through the X-ray beam, we actually have a lot of tiny little microcrystals, and we just inject them through the X-ray beam in random orientations, and then sum up the intensities from there and get our, our complete data set from that. Um, this is particularly good if you, for example, have crystals that you have trouble growing into a large crystal, because proteins don't actually like crystallizing. It's very hard to crystallize proteins because they're very big molecules. And they also usually have very disordered um, yeah, domains. And that makes them not, not good for crystallizing. OK, so this is the general pipeline of what we're trying to do. We some way introduce crystals into our X-ray beam. We collect our diffraction patterns. And then we want to calculate how our electron density, because it's the, the electrons are what actually diffract the, the X-rays in the crystal, which is why we call it an X-ray. Uh, an electron density is what we calculate. And then we somehow want to get from this random electron density that we calculate 
to our final protein structure. And then once we have the protein structure, we can go ahead and do interesting things like time resolve experiments, see how these proteins actually work or um, drug development, see whether we can bind different drugs to it, maybe inhibit it. Um, or, yeah, depending on, on what we're targeting. So I, I assume everybody is familiar with Bragg's law, right? It's just if we, we have some sort of lattice and we diffract x-rays off it, there are certain conditions where we get constructive interference, where the, the waves overlap, and we, we get one of these dark spots. And then there are conditions where these waves don't interfere constructively with one another, and we don't get a bright spot. And the thing required to, for this is a periodic lattice. That's why it's called crystallography, and what, why we get these characteristic diffraction patterns. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go into that because I assume that much is, is known by everybody, right? Um, but yeah, once we have these diffraction patterns, we, we somehow will we'll phase it and we'll get into why we have to phase it to get this electron density where we can then build our protein model into. And then finally, hopefully have a nice protein model that we deposit in the protein data bank. Um, and that is so we can share it with the whole world so everybody else can use it. Um, so to, this is, it's okay, so one thing about crystallography that's really important is that the, when, when the molecules pack into the crystal, it's not actually that they are all just packed like bricks next to one, not even bricks, but you know, aligned bricks next to one another. It's slightly more complicated, um, hopefully, and that is called uh, symmetry. Um, so our, using different symmetry operators, our molecule actually pack into the crystal um, in what's called the space group. And this is really important because there's only a certain number of, of space groups and symmetry operators that are allowed for protein crystals compared to normal crystals. So when you hear crystallography, that's, that's not just proteins, um, which is known as macromolecular crystallography, but you also have small molecule crystallography. And small molecule crystallography has a lot more packings that it can do in the unit cell, um, whereas macromolecular crystallography has less possible space groups, but the phasing problem becomes a lot harder. And we'll go into why this is. The, the thing that we need to do is why I included this slide is because I need to introduce some terminology because I'm gonna be talking about it. And the first thing that we talk about is the asymmetric unit. And the asymmetric unit is the smallest part in your crystal that can be um, used to describe the whole crystal by symmetry related um, operations. So in this case, the asymmetric unit is, is my little dog here. And then the next thing that we have is the unit cell. And this is actually one set of symmetry related operations. So you pack your, your unit cell is the entity in the crystal that repeats itself over and over next to one another, like these little um, bricks that have been laid on top of one another. And within this unit cell, the asymmetric unit um, is reproduced using symmetry operators. Um, so yeah, that's what you need to know. You need to know the asymmetric unit usually refers to one molecule of the protein, sometimes two if it's a dimer or a trimer, um, but it's usually one molecule of, of the protein. And, but there's multiple of these in the unit cell. So it's not like there's one molecule per unit cell. That's basically all this slide um, is trying to tell you and what you need to take away from this. Now, as I said before, proteins are very, very complicated molecules. Oops. So um, I just wanted to show you what this kind of looks like so you have an idea. This is a unit cell of a, a protein called proteinase K. It's a very common protein that we use a lot in bio, uh, biochemistry applications as well. And it packs into the space group called P43212. This is three, screw, three different screw axes in the three dimensions. And as you can see here, it's not, it's, well, this is, like I said, one unit cell. And you can see it's, it's quite a, a full unit cell. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of atoms in there because every single one of these balls is an atom. Then every single bend in this, this backbone is an atom. So there's a lot of atoms in a single unit cell in protein crystallography. And the asymmetric unit is one of these guys. So, so the um, green, which is the protein, and the red is actually the active site of protein, um, which I just colored like that because it's, yeah, just, just to help, help you see all the different, how many molecules are in one of these asymmetric units. 
Okay, so I mentioned that there's only certain things, um, there are certain symmetry operations allowed for proteins. And the reason for this is that um, we can't have mirror print planes in, in proteins. And this is because protein has a particular chirality, meaning it's always twist in the same way. As you, you guys probably know, it's, it's more easy to understand from DNA because people tend to know that DNA is a twisted molecule. Um, but it's the same for protein. If we'd have a mirror plane as a symmetry operator, then our molecule would actually twist in the other way. And this is just physiologically doesn't happen. Right? Very, very extremely rare. Um, should be the correct way to say it. Um, but this means we, we can't have this mirror plane operators in our protein crystals. So we actually, in the end, only end up with 65 different space groups that our, our protein can be in, um, in the crystal. And this is actually something that's bad in some sense, because if we, we have this, I'm not sure if George will get into this, but mirror planes actually so it's called racemic proteins. If this were uh, racemic crystals are a special case where you actually have only mirror planes. And in that case, your, your phase problem goes away because you can only have zero or 180 degrees. But um, I think George will probably touch on that maybe. Um, but if not, it's yeah slightly outside of the scope because it doesn't apply to protein crystals, unfortunately, as I mentioned. Okay, one important thing that we need to know is um, that in, in protein crystallography, we talk about these, these little spots that we see. They're all individual well, reflections, and we need to kind of give them a name. And this name that we give to each of these spots depends on the space group, um, and it's called a, a Miller index. And the Miller index is just a, it's a symbolic vector representation, as you can see here, um, for the orientation of an atomic plane in the crystal lattice that would actually result in, um, well, crystallographic conditions and bright conditions that give a reflection. And they are defined as the reciprocals um, of the fractional intercepts with the crystallographic plane. That's why they're always um, called like one, zero, one, one, two, one. Um, and the main thing you need to know is that every reflection has a particular Miller index. And they're called HKL values. So this 101 would be the HK and the L value, which is the so HKL are the crystallographic planes, which in real space are A, B, and C. Um, and yeah, this is just important because we're going to be drawing a lot of Harker diagrams, and a Harker diagram is always for one Miller index reflection, so one reflection with a certain set of Miller indices. That will get you that, and hopefully it will become clear what I mean. I just wanted to give you an idea that Miller indices basically is a diffraction, a positive diffraction condition in a crystal. Okay, just um, because it's quite nice. Um, this is actually the same space group. Um, so both these crystals um, or proteins crystallize in the same space group. They only have different unit cell parameters because they're different sizes. And this was collected, same beamline, same extra energy, same detector distance, same everything. And what you can see really nicely is which protein is smaller, because as we know, in reciprocal space, everything is reversed. So a small molecule with a small unit cell will have a large distance in reciprocal space. So this guy is the, the smaller protein, and this guy on the left is the bigger protein, because his spots are closer together. Okay, so um, now we've, we've quickly touched on, on what we can kind of get from the detector. Um, this is these Miller indices with an intensity value and an HKL. So that's kind of to be thought of as the reciprocal coordinates, um, our HKL. And then we have an intensity value, which we get from the detector. That's what we get from basic crystallographic um, uh, data analysis. But now we going to go into um, how we actually get to the electron density and the final protein structure from there. Um, I'm going to skip that. That's not that interesting. And this guy, I assume you've seen tons of. Um, this is just how important the phase is. If you use the wrong phase, you end up with the wrong thing. Um, so I'm also going to skip over this because I assume you've seen this. Now, the main reason why we have the phase problem in crystallography is if you think about it, right, when you have the incoming um, x-ray um, plane uh, sorry yes the incoming um, x-ray plane then it diffracts off of every single atom in the crystal or every electron from every atom in the crystal 
which introduces a phase difference between all of the reflect, uh, reflected, uh, refracted or scattered waves. And now we have in a protein crystal that we have over a thousand different atoms. So um, what George so we'll talk about later is called direct methods, which is where we kind of take a guess at what the structure looks like and then calculate the phases from there and see whether it matches the intensities that we get. But we can't do that in a protein simply because we have so many different atoms that we don't have enough computers that can actually run through all of these possibilities. So we have to find a different way to come up with phases to match our intensities that we calculated from the detector. And the easiest solution is molecular replacement, but I'm not going to talk about that because George goes into that. Um, I'm actually going to go into experimental phases. And the simplest thing to do is to reduce our problem down. Like I said, we have thousands of atoms, and that's the biggest problem that we have. We can't start and, and just guess at um, how these contribute to the phases. So what can we do to reduce the problem from a thousand atoms to just a few atoms? And the trick is that we can add heavy atoms to our proteins. Proteins have a tendency to, to bind to things in their active sites or other sites. And what if we can actually bind something to every molecule in our asymmetric unit and then only solve the structure of that um, and then kind of get our phases from there? And that is called single isomorphous replacement. So what we have here is that we collect two data sets. We collect the native protein and then we collect a data set from the, the crystal with the protein bound to something um, because the structure factors are vectors, right? So they simply add, which means we can also subtract them. So if we subtract the native data from the heavy atom derivative data, then what we should be left with is just the heavy atom data. And this works on one condition, and that is that the crystals remain isomorphous upon heavy atom derivatization, which means the unit cell doesn't change, the packing doesn't change, and the molecules stay in the same spot relative to one another in the crystal, then this holds, and then we can do this. And then we can solve this substructure just using direct methods. Um, as I said, George will tell you what direct methods is. It can be used for, for small problems with small atoms or Patterson methods, which I'm also not gonna go into because I think George may also touch on that. But Patterson methods are also a trick that mathematical trick that we can use where we basically turn our atomic coordinates into distances instead. And then we can use that to solve for, uh, solve small problems. So where we have small atoms. And once we have the structure factors, because note now we, it's not structure factor amplitudes anymore, it's structure factors. We know the phases now, right? Because we, we solved the phases for that. Um, then we can actually go and calculate what our, our protein um, structure factor contributions are from the heavy atom derivative. Because for this is now for called a Harker diagram, and it's for every reflection, every HKL, every Miller index reflection, um, we can draw one of these. And all it is is basically what contributes to that structure factor. And if we draw in here, so the, the structure factor from our scatterer that we just solved, um, so we're drawing him in backwards because he's negative, and um, then because we're subtracting him from this guy. And then draw a circle because we know the amplitude, right? That's what we measured. We measured the amplitude of the structure factor because that's what we got from our detector. So if we now just draw a circle around here with the magnitude of FPA and a circle around the origin with the magnitude of FP, which is the structure factor magnitude of the protein itself, then these will intersect at two points. And where these two intersect, so these are two different data sets, right? FP was the native crystal that we collected, FPA was the heavy atom derivative that we collected. Now where these two interact, uh, intersect are the only possible phase angles that we have. So we can actually calculate FP or if we wish FPA, depending on which structure we actually wanna solve in the end, it doesn't matter. Um, from here, we have two possible phase angles, but again, this is two possible phase angles for every single reflection that we have. Um, 
but this is already good, right? It's a good starting point. And the standard thing that we do in, in SEER phasing, so single isomorphous replacement, is that we simply take the average phase angle as a starting phase angle. So we draw a line through the two, and we, we use this guy as our starting structure factor with this phase, um, which would be phi SEER. And then we have to start refining from these phases. But the good thing is that we now have an actual phase angle that we can start with for each reflection. And now, how do we go about refining these phases? Because, I mean, this is it's pretty wrong, right? If this were the right phase angle, it's way too big. If this were the right phase angle, it's way too small. And we have this for every reflection. So every reflection is like kind of maybe in the right area, but it's not very in the right area. So this is called phase refinement. And this, I think you've probably heard a lot about today. This is also based on normal real space constraints. Um, so we have our native magnitudes um, that we measured from the detector. We have our experimental phase estimates that we now calculated from our, our Harker diagrams. And what we also usually know is the solvent content in the crystal. And this is because through our symmetry related reflections of our uh, symmetry related molecules in our space group, we roughly know how many molecules actually fit inside the crystal or within the asymmetric unit and therefore in the, the crystal. And this is for proteins usually around 50%. So it's actually quite large. Um, then we, we know something about the density histogram, so the atomicity. This is just how the atoms actually arrange in a protein molecule, um, which we know because other structures have been solved before and we kind of know what a protein looks like. Um, the molecular packing, because we know this from the space group. Um, and chain connectivity. We know that a protein is usually one long connected chain. So when we now use our phase estimates to calculate our electron density in real space, so we Fourier transform it, um, then we know that what we're looking for is one long connected density. And what we can then do is impose a real space constraint, as you guys have probably heard about, um, that we know that the solvent, for example, surrounding the protein, anywhere where the density is quite a low value, it's probably solvent, which is disordered, which shouldn't contribute to the actual structure of the protein, and therefore doesn't give much electron density because it's disordered, right? So it doesn't actually diffract the, um, into the reflection. And um, what we can do is we can simply say anywhere below a certain level is probably zero. Um, and that's called solvent flattening. We just set it to zero. We say this is probably solvent, not protein. Let's put the value here to zero. We can do solvent flipping, which is, I think, what is most commonly used currently. And that is that instead of setting it to zero, we just flip the sign on it. So instead of it being positive, we make it negative. Um, and this is just if we have like different parts of the map, um, then they don't interfere as much with or bias one another if we, we do it that way, because it's not setting it to a specific value. Or a histogram matching, which is kind of putting an, an envelope around it, saying that we know what a, a protein density typically looks like. Um, and so we try and match it to that in real space. And then we convert it back to Fourier space, take our new phases with our original uh, measured amplitude, and uh, Sorry, that's not true. Um, yes, we're still in, got our electron density. Then we try to build the protein model into there um, and, and see whether we can start actually placing models. We usually start tracing the backbone, try to just build a backbone of some sort into here. Then we Fourier transform that, um, calculate what, what we, well, calculate what the electron density should look like from that model, Fourier transform that, and then use those phases with our originally measured amplitudes as our new starting point. Um, and that is called density modification. And we, we try to um, keep doing that iteratively until our, our map kind of condenses into one long connected sausage, or what you like to call it. Um, and uh, therefore get closer and nearer to solving our, our actual protein structure. Um, okay, but surely there's there's gotta be more. and. Um, if you think about it, right, in the Zia case, we have two possible phase angles. So what about if we, we just add a third circle to this? Because it's not that difficult, right? All we need to do is collect a third derivative, because um, then we, we have another amplitude that we can solve. We have another substructure we can solve. And then the three circles should hopefully only actually intersect in one point. And then we'd actually have a really good 
um, guesstimate of the initial phase already. And this is called multiple isomorphous replacement, um, which is done often. The problem that you have here is whilst a protein often can, can bind a heavy metal of some sort, finding two that it binds is a bit harder. It's still doable, but it's a bit harder. Um, but this, so we get, like I said, we get a good guesstimate. We don't actually get very exact phases because we do live in the real world. So this intersection here is not that clear cut in the real world. It will probably be, you know, that these guys intersect here and these guys intersect there, but we roughly know what we are expecting. So we would still have to go about to find the phases by building the structure into the actual electron density, um, but it should hopefully work. So that's one way of doing it, um, which is isomorphous replacement. And it's really nice. The big problem that we have with, with this technique is that we need isomorphic crystals. Like I mentioned, when the unit cell constants cannot change, the space group cannot change, the packing in the crystal cannot change, or this fails, we can no longer use it. We need to somehow determine accurate heavy atom positions if we make a mistake there, if our um, heavy atom substructure is wrong, um, then this will fail, it simply won't work. Um, and one of the, the big disadvantages is that when we soak heavy atoms or co-crystallize our protein with heavy atoms present, our crystals usually become very fragile and difficult to handle. So it actually experimentally um, is a bit of a nightmare. And the other thing is that if we have heavy atoms, and the reason we use heavy atoms, I don't think I mentioned that, is just because they give us a strong signal. So FA here is usually a very, very small contribution of FPA. So we want to use a very heavy atom so that we can maximize the signal that, that FA actually contributes. Um, but heavy metals are very radiation sensitive. So as soon as we start adding in heavy metals, um, we make our, our whole crystal radiation more radiation sensitive and um, our diffraction patterns will suffer because of it. One of the nice things about isomorphous replacement as well is that we don't care about the extra energy that we actually use. Um, so because it, it doesn't matter. So we can actually choose an extra energy that's usually ideal for the beam line or um, that uh, minimizes radiation damage. So go a bit lower in the energy so we, we get less radiation damage. Um, which is, is nice from an experimental point of view, and we're not constrained in that regard. Okay, now anomalous scattering. I assume this has come up already as well. And it's, it's basically only as very simple. It depends on what energy we actually use for our x-rays to scatter from, from our, our atoms in our crystal. Because if we use a low energy, right, then a photon can only be scattered or not. It cannot be absorbed by, by an electron in the um, protein. Um, so what we end up with is a nice real atomic scattering factor without any dispersive contributions. But if we have a high enough energy, then some photons will scatter normally, but some of them will actually be absorbed by the crystal. Um, and then they get re-emitted and this can uh, introduce an actual imaginary dispersive term into our, our scattering factor. And this is called anomalous scattering um, because they're now no, no longer, the scattered x-rays are no longer in phase with the incoming x-rays. And this is something that we can also use to our advantage if we were actually trying to phase a protein structure. Um, so here I just have a couple of these um, scattering curves for um, well, anomalous scattering coefficient curves for a couple of elements. So this I believe is mercury and here we have sulfur. And what we see are these edges where suddenly these con con anomalous contributions here, um, they change depending on where we measure, whether we, we measure with x-rays of three kV in this case or two kV, or in this case, just above 12 kV or below 12 kV. Um, so can we use this to therefore somehow deduce what the phases actually are? And the answer is we can, because the nice thing about this anomalous scattering is that it is the, the real part F double dash is always um, 90 degrees from, from the uh, original, uh, from the like normal scatterers, um, which is, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to introduce Friedel's law. This is something we use in crystallography that's actually very important and it applies to centrosymmetric reflections. So any reflection that is uh, related 
uh, center symmetrically around the origin, they in crystallography have the same magnitude. It's because your diffraction pattern is symmetric, right? Um, but they have opposite phases. And if all atoms have the same scattering behavior, and uh, well, this is if they all just, you know, are scatter, have the same scattering behavior, no anomalous scattering. Then we have H F H K L, which is has the same magnitude as F minus H minus K minus L, um, and opposite phases. Now, if we have anomalous scattering in there as well, then we have this F double dash distribution, which is always at a right angle, so as a 90 degree phase shift. And then the nice thing is that the magnitudes stay the same, but the phases are no longer the same. So um, that's just something to bear in mind, because if we now add in the um, fact that only some atoms scatter anomalously, right, which means some atoms will give rise to, to F H K L and F minus H minus K L minus L, but some atoms have this anomalous contribution. So this is the, the real part and the imaginary part of this dispersive contribution. Then we see that F H K L is no longer the same magnitude as minus F H K L. There's a difference there. And this difference we can measure, right? Because remember we measure the magnitudes on, on the detector, on the X-ray detector. We can measure this. Um, and this is called the bifoot difference. I'm sure there's multiple ways to prefer uh, pronounce bifoot as well. Um, but yeah, this, this is, is known as bifurcate difference and it only applies to certain pairs of reflections. So not all reflections, only the ones that are symmetrically related around the origin um, due to the symmetry of the diffraction pattern and not the symmetry of the crystal. Um, but anyways, if we now go ahead and, and square these differences that, like I said, we can measure for some reflections, um, then this squared factor if in our, our Patterson map, so remember we mentioned, mentioned earlier that a Patterson map basically takes atomic distances, uh, atomic coordinates and changes it into atomic distances. Um, this delta F squared will actually only contain distances of our substructure of the anomalous scattering contributors, um, which is great because it means we can again solve the substructure from that. And if we solve the substructure, then we have both the amplitudes and the phases of the substructure. So can we now use that to somehow calculate what the phases of the protein therefore have to be? And this is called single wavelength anomalous dispersion or SAD phasing. Um, and the answer of course is yes, we can use this because if we, we do this for, for both the reflections that right have, have slightly different values now, um, then we can, can calculate what their contributions are. And then if we, we draw the magnitudes that we measure for each one, again, at the, the negative of their um, structure factor, then we get two intersects again, which serve as, as a starting point for our sad phases, which is great. So we can, can go from there again, and we'll do the same thing as we did for the Zier case. We just take the average of the two, and we use that as our starting phase. And then we go ahead again and refine the phases um, to, to actually hopefully get a structure. And this is known as sad phasing, but of course we can also um, try and break this, this phase ambiguity that we have these two possible phases by measuring multiple data points. And this is called mad phasing. It's called multiple um, anomalous dispersion phasing. And what we, we try to do with mad phasing is that we actually try to maximize the, dis the dispersive differences between the different data sets to make them as different as possible. So what we'll do is we'll pick a nice edge. So in this case, I, I took selenium, which is a very common element used in frozen crystallography um, because you can actually substitute selenium into some uh, an amino acid into the protein. Um, and then we'd measure just above one of these absorption edges and just below one of these absorption edges. So we have this maximal difference. Um, and then usually if we, our crystal is still happy or we have more crystals and we have more beam time, we'll collect two more wavelengths. So one that's called high remote that is way above the edge and one low remote that is way below the edge because then we have four equations solving for two possible phase angles. So that would be great. And then we, we should be able to zero in on the correct phases and actually just get one phase angle. So this is um, great. Sorry, this is, is wrong. Um, this should be 
sad and mad. Um, what are the, the, the things that we need to do a sad or mad phasing? Well, we need to collect multiple data sets, which means we either need multiple crystals or we need a crystal that is really stable and we can measure multiple data sets because we have to have a highly redundant complete data set at different wavelengths, at different X-ray energies. Um, the other thing is that we actually need to know exactly where the fluorescence edge is and whether the element that we're going for is actually in our crystal. So we usually have to do a fluorescence scan of the beamline just to be sure that we measure as close to the edge as possible. Um, and again, we have to make heavy atom derivatives of our, of our crystal in most cases. And again, crystals, uh, proteins don't actually like this um, deriv uh, deriv derivatization. Now there is one nice thing about sad phasing and that is that we actually can use sulfur which is in some amino acids, so cysteines and methionines, they actually contain sulfur. And as we saw earlier, I think I had, yeah, yeah, I had the sulfur um, this, uh, anomalous scattering coefficients. And as you can see, sulfur actually has an edge that is relatively close to where we can measure reasonable diffraction data. We can usually measure, so usually we measure around 7 kV, 6 to 7 kV if we, we try to do sulfur sad. And then we, we do still have a difference, not a big difference, but a small difference. And often if we, we get good high resolution data, then we can actually solve the structure of the native protein without having to add in any heavy atoms, which is nice. And that's why sulfur SAD is a very, very powerful thing. The same with selenium SAD or MAD. Uh, so like I said, selenium, we can actually use a methionine residue when we make our protein, when we engineer our protein that has selenium instead of sulfur. And then we just manage, so selenium has a nice edge within where we typically operate, a typical synchrotron beamline operates for macromolecular crystallography. So then we can just get more signal and it makes it easier. So this is, these are the two most commonly used SAD and MADs, I would say. Um, the other thing we can do is that we combine the two, right? If we have our single isomorphous replacement case at the start, right, where we have the two phase angles, well, we could, since we already have the heavy atom in there, right, if we just measure this, not at any wavelength, but above the edge, then we could just use the anomalous contribution to add, uh, to, um, add in uh, on top of our zero phases, and then we should again result uh, at one possible phase angle. And this is called ZRAS, or if we add in multiple wavelengths, because we like being redundant and doing things more accurately, it turns to NIRAS, um, which is a nice, nice thing. Usually works if we, we have good data. Um, okay, so just a, a small thing. Are we done now, now that we've managed to solve the phases and build some sort of model into our electron density? Um, almost, we still validate our structure typically, which is just making sure that it actually complies with real space conditions, that we know what the stoichiometry of a protein is, what bonds are allowable, what torsion angles are allowable. Um, so we, we always have to make sure that this is all true, that this fits. And once we've, uh, uh, yeah, one important note is we do need to fix these validation issues. Very often people are just like, oh, I have a structure and then they it in the PDB, and then you look at it and there's parts that don't make sense. So if you have validation issues, fix them. However, if you, you, you're flagging validation issues, but your data actually clearly shows that's how the protein looks, well, then it's probably true, right? If, if we knew exactly what the protein looked like in a specific region, we wouldn't have to actually go about and phase it. We could have just, I don't know, had some sort of computer modeling. So don't fix what isn't broken, but do fix what is can be fixed, should be fixed before you're depositing your structures in the protein data bank, because other people will use it for molecular replacement, for example, as George will tell you in the next talk. And I think I've actually maxed out my time. So we, no serial data comparison, sorry. We'll skip through this and go straight for questions. <laughs>